I'm grateful to be invited here. Uh, I'm grateful to be in this room with people who are working every day. Um, we say working tirelessly, that's actually not true. <laughs> that's not true at all. Um, but I'm very grateful to have this opportunity. We ask how to make our schools safe, but what we really want uh, is peace. It's a bigger target. Our poet laureate, uh, Sister Sonia Sanchez, tells us that in many ways, um, including her beautiful haiku, a poetry form that she calls inherently peaceful. I'll come back to that. The point is that we want peaceful schools. California Congressman, Congresswoman Maxine Waters um, was accredited with the phrase, no justice, no peace. Not to excuse or to predict, but rather to explain the violence that erupted after the Rodney King verdict in Los Angeles. The same phrase could describe the dropout rate in Los Angeles now. Um, in the last uh, five or six years, the numbers of young people in Los Angeles who drop out um, is nearly as large as the much larger district of New York City. To put the matter positively, though, if we want peace, we must aim at greater justice. We want to believe that we share this idea of justice, that each and every delightful, delicious child in our United States, and certainly each one here in Philadelphia, deserves the safe, clean, welcoming, and intellectually challenging atmosphere with nourishing food, arts, sports, and instructional and behavioral supports. I'm not sure whether we all believe that. Surely good, equitable public education was not a founding principle here in the United States. We didn't start out believing it. Puritans required small towns to maintain primary schools and larger towns to put up grammar schools so that young people could read the Bible and better employ themselves. These homogeneous towns were tribes and local folks took care of their own. In the South, with more differentiation of race and class, the town governance did not always require schools. Rich whites could hire tutors. Some middle class whites went to school. Poor whites, free blacks learned from anyone they knew how, sometimes setting up their own schools, or not at all. Blacks in slavery, of course, were expressly forbidden to gain education. By 1870, in the US, according to Education Week, only about 3% of Americans were finishing the equivalent of a high school diploma. By 1940, countrywide, we were up to about half. Then came the Second World War and the 30-year Great Compression, where the middle class grew and America grew stronger and more wealthy than any co country had ever imagined we could become. It was a time that many folks think of as a golden age of public education. Often when we talk back to the way schools were or when they were good or I remember when, it's often that time. The Civil Rights Movement urged America toward equal rights and we fought in public ways, sometimes in ugly ways, about educational equal opportunity. I remember when I was a child, about seven or eight, seeing uh, on our, we had a, we had an apartment then. It was a living room and then was my parents slept in on the couch and then the bedroom and then the kitchen. And there was this big TV, it was a TV and my mother was so proud of it and it had a radio in it. And we would all sit there. I remember seeing uh, on that black and white TV young people um, hosed and grabbed and dragged and spat upon. At the same time in my own school here in Philadelphia, my teachers let us seven and eight year olds understand that white flight had emptied not only our blocks, but also it had taken away their preferred students. I can only remember a few specifics. One teacher would tell us how her old students had done better and more thorough and delightful projects than we, and how she hoped that by showing us, we would improve. I remember feeling the injustice of that statement when she pulled out a volcano from the closet that I remember sort of like a, 
almost like a museum of the old days, which she really kept harking back to. She pulled out a volcano before the science fair um, and, and told us that this was an example of, of the kind of, of exhibit we should do. And I remember thinking that she had told us specifically we were supposed to do our own work and that I could see that that volcano with its dust on it, I don't know when it was done, had been made by somebody's parents. It had not been made by a kid. We understood that many of the adults who were charged with caring for us did not care. Now, as an adult, I understand what that means. That without cultural cues and contractual mandates, it was easy for them to let our achievement slip. Everything seemed the same, by the way. We were in the same classes, we did the same things. Everything seemed the same. But because the teachers thought we were not able to achieve, we didn't. They expected rather than corrected our mistakes. One teacher allowed the girl in front of me to sit in her own urine when she peed herself, and then she would treat her with contempt because of the smell. Um, that treatment did not in any way stop this girl from wetting herself. Boys, it was almost always boys, black boys, were made to stand at the back of the room with dictionaries in their outstretched palms until their arms sagged. Adults who loved being with us stay in my heart and memory. It was Madame Wynne, the black French teacher with Cleopatra Bangs. Bonjour, mes amis. She swept in with perfume and perfect grammar. Je me lève, je me lave, je me brosse mes dents, je mange un céréal avec sucre et de crème. Say it again. The science teacher brought in all kinds of things for experiments. He had boxes and bags and he would just lay out this stuff and we could hear him coming because it would be clunk, 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 clunk up the hallway. And we'd look at each other and say, oh my God, what does he have this week? Things was wonderful. There was an old world violin teacher with very plosive consonants. He would spit on me like this all the time. He would hold like this. He would tell us that in Germany, where he had escaped from, thank God, thank God he escaped from, that, that they used to put a tack on the bottom of the violin so that when lazy little children like you would get a hand like this, no, the tack would get you. He said, of course, in America, we're not allowed to use these things because <laughs> it's so soft. But, <laughs> but you could almost feel like the tack would almost get you, like it wouldn't quite get you, but you, <laughs> We played terribly. I mean, it was, we didn't play very well, but we had great, you know, we held it like he made us stand. What does this have to do with safety? This nearly quaint retelling of casual racism from another century. It's the setup for today. Groups of families who valued education and whom our education system valued these were separated. So too was a natural, almost tribal contract and trust between the school system and its main core constituents, the people whom it serves. If teachers have doubts about how much students can learn, then they will be less likely in large and small ways all day, all week, all month, all year. <coughs> to insist on achievement. And if students and families do not believe that the system itself, all of the adults working in there, that that system, those adults do not delight in their children and wish them well, then they do not bring their best selves to the door. My mother never came to school, but she was angry. And she had her reasons. Since the 1970s, by the way, it is true that public school systems, thanks be to God, have continued to bring in more students 
and groups of students who previously were left out of the school district and the school system. We have more students in who have special needs, English language services, needing social and emotional supports, needing special methods to handle attention deficit disorders, learning differences, and so on. Those students, now we understand it is our job to educate them, they are more difficult. They require better, stronger, smarter, more, more self-possessed and loving individuals. We have technologies. We understand, I, mean, I don't mean technology, I mean we, we have ways now of, of teaching students. We have much, much more um, knowledge than we had. All of this is good. We must raise orchids, more of them, however, and we can't do it as if they're philodendrons. We've got to be more careful. But it's also true that even as more of these students are coming in, as keepers of our mainstream culture began to move away from cities and their public schools, and as some within the district agreed with them, that the students they preferred to teach were fewer and fewer, the public school brand diminished. You know, we talk about brand, right? I have a little tiny arts organization. People come and say, you know, what's the brand? What's the Art Sanctuary brand? I said, I don't know. Excellent art in the community, for real? I said, no, no, we need a brand. The public school brand diminished. We made schools unsafe as a city by thinking of poor students, immigrant students, Latino, Asian, special needs, and African Americans as other people's children. We still do it. Even though our national struggles, our creeds, our faiths, and our common sense tells us to do unto these children as we would do unto our own. We fought each other, I'll tell you, in my old school. We were very tense. We were angry. We bullied and were bullied. Book bags, as we called them then. Lunch money, lunches in brown bags, and those little, some of us had those tins. We had bags. My mother said she wasn't going to give me another one to lose. I must have lost a lot of them. Tins, tokens with holes in the center. It's a PTC. We stole them from each other. I don't know if they kept statistics about all this back then, but it never occurred to me that an adult would help. So why tell? In 1969, the national graduation rate hit a peak of 77% nationally. It has fluctuated since nationally, but never moved much higher. Our rate of imprisonment in the same period has increased by 500%, even as the population has risen less than 40. You know the numbers that one American adult in 100 spends time behind bars, with the rate rising to one in nine, in some places for the young black men. This, too, is a context that affects safety in schools, even as it gives the lie, the lie to our explanations as a society for the poverty of spending on education. Even as I strain with other members of the School Reform Commission to fit the needs of our children into a too small, criminally too small budget, I know that we as a society have decided that we will spend 14,000 per child for, per year on an 18 year old who has experienced poverty, trauma, loss, violence, hunger. We've made that decision. We've decided it by agreeing to it. 4,000 of that uh, plus something goes into heat and roofing and boilers with 10,000 left for teachers, aides, librarians, trips, nurses a couple times a week, books for the god-awful PSSA coaching manuals 
from which people do indeed teach to prep for the test, but are not as fun as books and that nobody really enjoys. When he goes out on Saturday night, that 14K a year, 18 year old, when he goes out at night and he buys marijuana, I can hear his grandmother saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. He gets caught in jail. We as a society have said that we will now pay 30,000 to incarcerate him. There are great inequities in our educational funding, by the way, among city, suburban, and rural districts, but I want to point out that imprisonment beats even Lower Marion's educational spending. I say this to set context. As we say in my family, especially when one of us has come up short, these are reasons but not excuses. There are no excuses. I don't care how little we get. There are no excuses for allowing too many violent incidents to happen in and around schools and in the cyberspace connected to school life and school relationships. But I ask you to think of the many ways that our incarceration policies have affected the way our general population thinks about all punishment, including our children. I ask you to think furthermore about how the racial consequences of drug wars, three strike, and other national culture decisions in the last generations have trained us to believe that we must, we simply must punish these out of control, disrespectful, pants hanging down kids more harshly. That they deserve it, that they don't understand anything else, that there's no talking to them, that some of them don't want to learn anyway and we should get rid of them and get them out. That there's only but so much you can expect of them, that they need to get off their asses and go to work. Those are quotes. I'm a writer, I keep quotes that I hear. These generalized assumptions of our outside society do indeed have an absolute effect on our students and families and schools. I'll quote just one of the many great educators it is my privilege to serve. This teacher says, my class got called the bad kids right from the beginning of school. We had the largest number of African American boys and the whole group took it in and started thinking of themselves that way. We're the bad class. So one day when I had them for homeroom, I closed the door, I just closed the door, I took the phone off the hook, nobody was gonna call me. I pushed back all the desks I threw the chairs in a circle and said, okay, I've got a poem here about grief. We're gonna take this poem for a walk. Sit down and read this. They read it and talked about it and told each other about losses. Dear Lord, they have absorbed so many things. But I tell you, once they made that circle, once they were fully human to each other, that class became a different group. And I wanna tell you that every indication of achievement began to go up that year. When I listen to this teacher as I have to so many others whom I admire and enjoy, I thought of the words of poet laureate Sanchez who says that poetry at its best asks, what does it mean to be fully human? That's always her phrase, fully human, and I heard it in the teacher talking about being fully human. In order to create peaceful schools in a violent city, we must build a level of system-wide intentionality and city-wide support that we have not seen in years. We have to ask ourselves and every person we know to take the pledge and drink the Kool-Aid, as Human Relations Commission Rue Landau, uh, Director Rue Landau always says, we've got to drink the Kool-Aid. What does it mean to us as the extended family of those children those, what does it mean to us? They, they are our extended family. Somebody said a naughty thing about how if you walk up and down the street and you see everybody, you see these people my age pushing baby strollers while somebody's in school and you can no longer tell what baby goes with what grandmother anymore. Really, they don't look like each other all the time anymore. For real, they're all our children. They are all our children. What does it mean to us us city step parents to commit ourselves to giving these children a shot at growing into their full humanity. Another little cohort is going to come in September with their unbelievable resilience, 
their intelligence, their peccadilloes, their problems, their skills, their needs, their parents, their grandparents. Let me say this as firmly and with as much certainty and celebration as possible. Many individual schools and many group of schools, groups of schools, do just this every day. Many of them do. With intention and focus, they create schools where children learn intellectually, emotionally, socially, physically, and vocationally to become whole, achieving people. Thousands of children from all socioeconomic classes in this city learn in safe schools, despite poverty, despite daily stressors that would break many people, despite constant laws, and despite sometimes really boring curriculum that makes everybody in the enterprise irritable and prone to acting out, despite being the fodder for America's favorite reality show, critique the poor, take their inventory, figure out what is wrong, what is wrong, what is wrong with those people, what is wrong with those people. It's, it, you know, as, as a writer, as somebody who's been an editor, one of the things we always dealt with were, what are the narratives that we love, that we say over and over? This is one of our American narratives. We like the feeling of righteous indignation about it. We like that more than we like the success of those people. We don't tell it. We don't revel in it. We don't look for it in the same way, with the same careful attention. And looking for it gives us the opportunity to replicate it. I want to repeat this and ask us to pause and think about the excellence and nobility of the work done by thousands of fine teachers, teachers' aides, helpers, administrators, principals, drivers, crossing guards, and counselors every single day. I want to hold them in the light. We read and talk about, we, humph we shake our heads about failing, failing, failing schools, broken system. I'm here, I'm, I'm, uh, my voice is a little down. I, I was sick on Monday, I went to the doctor, I had a fever, and as she was working, she's putting on the, the blood pressure cuff, and she's, she said to me, she's telling me, it's broken, these schools are broken. <laughs> And we talked about school. Then we talked about schools that worked. And she said, oh, yeah, I know so-and-so. It is a story we are used to. It makes us angry, and yet we repeat it, thinking that telling it will make us safer. But it continues, by the way, it continues to shame the children and to debase the brand. Many schools create wonderful islands of learning, growth, clarity, and high expectations, despite bait-and-switch budgets, despite the cuts we have put upon them, despite wasteful administrative zigzagging, and a city that looks on with amused contempt and pity. <clears throat> Heaven help us if we don't find who's working and hold them in the light. We've seen some schools, by the way, that are friendly and warm and customer oriented, but do not challenge students to learn. They are safe and forced to choose, parents will choose a safe, low performing school over an unsafe one, of course, but that's not good enough. Schools that have turned around safety records within a year or two usually find that their academic indices, though they may lag a little, rise too. Here's what they do. They set expectations before the school year begins for students and staff. They make clear among the adults the culture of the school they expect. This is caring in action. Students and parents feel it, and they set the expectations as a team. Everybody knows that you know when you walk into a school whether the secretary is down with it or not, right? Everybody. The teacher I mentioned earlier routinely takes students from a fourth grade reading level in seventh grade to proficient by eighth grade. How? First, by knowing they can do it and believing she can as well. They invite parents and grandparents in because more culturally familiar adults as partners in children's learning than school councils and governance and classrooms. 
increase safety. They cultivate donors and stakeholders and their anchors for social capital. Related to parent involvement but separate is the ability to welcome school external partners. We need them. And particularly, particularly the budgets have been cut. We need more people from the outside bringing in separate gifts. Trainers for social and emotional learning, such as a restorative justice or university programs, mentors, food supports, arts and music extras when needed for enrichment, sports, trips. And when I say that, I say some schools do have arts and music and, and would only need extra enrichment and some don't have it at all and need it desperately. Outdoor and environmental programs. They tell the truth, these schools that work, even though sometimes people want them to cover up incidents. They understand that real peace as opposed to surface safety comes from an atmosphere where students are learning, where they are wolfing down new ideas, grabbing for new skills, trying on new identities and growing. A caller to a radio program said it simply, children learn. They're going to learn whether you teach them or not. And what they learn is going to be the difference. We, they used to say that about my older child too in uh, preschool, but let's not, this is not about this is not about me inviting, okay? This is not about that. <laughs> no, it's not about that. I can tell you, though, that Children's Literacy Initiative brings reading K through three that would be one of the most powerful tools against primary school misbehavior. That rich engagement is the most powerful. That same child, actually, whom I just referenced before, even when it was not about us, she came home in first grade. I'll never forget. She came home. She took the books, whatever they were, and she threw them across the, threw them across the living room and said, "I can't weed. I can't. I'll never be able to weed." It was really funny. She'd never be able to say her R's. But, but you know, she had a parent who said to her, "Well, of course you will. You will. We'll do some. We read to her every night. Stay with." That, that fury she felt was fury that other people were reading in there and she wasn't. By the third grade, when students are there and they're not reading, that fury, it turns in, it turns out, it turns all over. Doing our core mission is the best thing we can do for safety. Ditto a database of strong mentors and us as a school district having a way regularly and honestly to invite those people in instead of telling them speak to the hand. Ditto an hour of running, swimming, playing, wall ball, jumping up and down, any doggone thing for children with too much nervous energy. Ditto spoken word instruction. Ditto, ditto, ditto a choir, you could name it. I say this here at Stanley because at Selma I have the luxury of time simply to thank and praise the educators, the families and students who work so hard to create their successes every day to give students voice. As chair of the SRC Committee for Safety and Engagement, I've spent the better part of three months, so I can't believe it's only been three months, <laughs> with a growing steering committee trying to build our own adult circle of understanding to review the Blue Ribbon Commission draft report and see what we can indeed, honestly, with fidelity, no excuses, make happen this year and next. In order to make the possible, in order to make possible some of the recommendations for school principals, for instance, to lead their teams, to create their own plans, to build safe cultures through orientation, parent involvement, and student voices. We have asked the school district, though distressed, though gutted, to commit to a few foundational disciplines. The first is to assign teachers earlier. The chief academic officer tells me that this is possible and that the school district this year is doing it. Allowing time to slide later and later undermines the professional possibilities. Principals must plan based on their team. I know this is basic. But if we don't do the basics, if we pretend like we don't need to do them, we can't do the next thing. Number two is to register students earlier. Our goal here is to have every child assigned in August 
saving first day of school movement for necessary changes. Many of our students do move. The aunt dies, they have to move in with the grandmother. Things happen, things change. But those changes have to be necessary, not just everybody. If we count them, that's, our, that's, a, that's, the, that's a huge purpose of our core mission. If our mission is to care for the children, we need to count who they are. We need to know who they are. We need to be able to tell them what classroom they're in so there's not a, a line in front of the school while they wait to get in. That's not okay. We need to do that so that we can then have the possibility, I'm not saying everybody will do it, but the possibility that a teacher who has been assigned on time can call a parent and say, I see that Jamal's gonna be in my class this year. My name is Miss Carey and we're really looking forward to having him come in. There is no reason on God's earth why we shouldn't do that to all the children we can find. What does this have to do with safety? I think we can see right away what it has to do. Orient the entire school then to the expectations and hold to them. We can do this if we know where everybody's in place and we don't have chaos for the first two weeks, but in fact we can have an orderly environment. It's like swaddling. Those of us with babies, you know, they're like, the, if you have, you don't have to have crazy control, but if we have order, it is very comforting to students, particularly students who have any kinds of special needs, any kind of chaos happening at home. To raise peaceful children in a violent culture, we have to have a peaceful school. At one school that has turned around its violent incidents very quickly, and they can do this in a year or two, by the way. We've seen that. We've seen that at... Um, a number of schools in the Blue, Ridge, Blue Ribbon Commission report, those include um, Tilden, Furness, Mastery, Shoemaker. At one school, after taking in each class, talking rather, in each classroom about what was expected, after doing exercises to deepen uh, student, student relationships and staff student relationships, I'd love it here if you want. Yeah. yeah, I would, thank you. That'd be great. I'm almost. After talking in each classroom about what was expected, having their circle, asking what the students want, what do you think is right? What should happen in this case? What about that? Well, what do you, they chatted up. They, understand what their baseline is. It sounds like a baseline sort of mammogram, you know? So you know what you should have. And all the kids know it, and then when something happens, they can say, oh, whoa, this is, whoa, isn't that right? After that, they came up with their own posters that they used to decorate the school to remind them of their pledges. Now, I will tell you that sometimes schools try to just put up the posters. It doesn't work that way. This is effective after a calm, orderly orientation, not a mashup. In middle and high schools, set up de-escalating, number four, set up de-escalating trainings to make students uh, understand what the school police may do in case of an emergency to bring sudden tempers down rather than ratchet up emotions. One of the things the de-escalation training does, and our Chief Patterson says he's very um, excited to do this, is it gets the children to, to get to know the school police person as a, as a human being. To you think of that as another one of the adults who's in the school as a, as, a, um, as a resource. And to understand what it looks like to bring down a situation instead of our usual narrative, which is, whoa, whoa, fight, fight, come on, fight, fight. Whoa. Wait, no, no, this, that's not what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Because according to our expectations, this is what we're trying to do. It helps for the whole community to understand that and to look at the police officer as someone who can help them with it. Because these are children, by the way. They don't know what to do with anger. They don't know what to do with the losses that their lives have piled in on them. We must teach them that too. Before all of this, before all of these, a summer safety retreat for principals and their school leadership teams 
That's a three-day summer safety retreat for principals and their leadership teams. Um, and then a two and a half day training with teachers um, on their safety to, to set up this orientation. And it's going to be different. If you have a school where 20 Liberian families have just moved into the neighborhood, and of course you can't know that if you haven't gotten your children's registration, right? You're going to change your orientation to welcome those students so that you don't have the situation of everybody comes in, everybody sits down, you look over and you say, oh, what the hell is your name? What? Right? So you know that your orientation is going to begin to address that. And, you, and you, you figure out how to make that exciting, make that good. You find out that that person's father is a storyteller, a drummer. You bring that in. There's all kinds of ways you go at it. It's going to be different in a school where there are 13 different languages spoken. It's going to be different in a school where the, sort of the, the crown jewel of the school is their, is their autism unit. It's going to be different. So you have to do it in your school for your children and your families. Positive behavior intervention supports. Nicknamed PBIS, trainings will happen in 40 schools to teach everyone in the building some of the social and emotional facts that they need to know and exercise every day. It'll also help them with a the timeline to think about how you do meetings and follow-ups. And all of this is about looking at students, talking about students. When I taught in a boarding school, we did this at faculty meetings on Fridays. And I didn't necessarily notice until the math teacher said, that John seemed to be depressed. And then, because I was coaching shot put, I would watch John. Oh, and then I'd see something different. And then maybe because I wasn't that close to John, but the other coach was, I'd say, you know, would you look out, would you talk about it? Just that kind, of, that's, that's what we do to, you know, sort of knit up the raveled sleeves. You just knit them up. Way beyond classroom management, although that is absolutely necessary too. This is more like a teacher's circle powerful prevention rooted in deepened relationships and clear expectations. Number seven, there are only 10 of these, and then, then you can hear them there. Number seven, ongoing work with victims advocates. Um, we have a victims advocate this year, Kelly Hodge, who's been extraordinary. And she's been doing great work with people who have experienced trauma and violence. She also is bringing in other partners. Um, Good Shepherd Mediation Group has brought to us this spring the their free, grant paid for already, victim offender conferencing, which they do in an extraordinary way. And we have the academic officer has found a couple schools to partner with so that that young people can see that when this event happens, it's not the end of relationship, but the beginning of a difficult conversation that they don't, they haven't seen happen before. They give one example of a, of a boy who, when asked by his teacher for homework, um, stood next, right near where she was, took his backpack, swung his backpack up, and knocked her on the ground with the backpack, saw her on the ground and ran out of the room. What the, the victim um, offender conferencing did was bring the two of them together. The teacher almost didn't want to. She was very afraid that it never happened to her before, where she'd been knocked over by a student's pet. But she said she didn't want her last picture of him to be him running out that door with that fear on his face, as well as that guilt. She also, for her other students, didn't want their last picture in their minds of the two of them to be the picture of her on the ground and him running out. She wanted them to understand that something else could come from this. What they found out in that, in that conference was that far from the boys not caring about the homework or saying to her, in other words, you want your homework, there's your homework, pal. In fact, the boy was getting tutored in her subject was not able to do well enough, and he and his mother had an argument about it the night before. He felt very badly about it. I don't know what happened to the homework, but that was, whether he had it or didn't. But when she asked, clearly he was not doing as well as he wanted. He didn't have what he should have. And he lost it. He didn't know how to deal with his own shame 
anger, his feeling of being felt feeling stupid, right? She didn't know these things. She talked to him about how it felt to her to be down on the ground. He had seen her as a teacher, as a grown-up. He hadn't realized that. He had to write and make an amends and ask her what she wanted from him to make amends. She's doing some kind of charity work and asked him to help her with it, so they work together. The other students, the piece for the other students, hear about, learn about this as well. So there, this amazing thing happened in their community. We have 60, um, at least 60 of those conferences being given to the school district as a gift and we'll look to do more. Partnership with the Federal Prosecutor's Office number eight for next year to share with the community a few talks with experts, some of them here, God help you, I'm gonna come after you guys, um, on youth health and crime prevention and even videos uh, on the topic of safety that students themselves have created. Number nine is we've talked to Philly Cam um, to pilot a TV program created by youth about safety issues in their lives. And 10 is a student subcommittee uh, of the safety group which has talked to us about their experience. Often they always come with the same, the same beginning which is not feeling cared for. It's where we started and it's where we end. Our mission is nurture. Our mission is care. We show that care by educating them and keeping them safe. This student subcommittee, however, about 20 of these, we have about 60 in this meeting, 20, um, we have decided to give them the opportunity to work as a little grants, granting foundation to spend $20,000 that was earned when the district allowed a TV pilot to film there in the atrium um, and was going to use it on safety. And instead, we're asking uh, the district and to allow the students themselves to talk about it, think about it, and become. Um, and we'll, we'll stream some of their talking about it to, to think about that because they, don't not, they not only need to have voice, but they also need to be given agency when there's an opportunity. And we never let kids spend money, right? We let them do all kinds of things, let them say poems. Sonia Sanchez, there, there are other things going on. There's a rewriting of the uh, memorandum of understanding. We'd like to update that with the police. There are other things. This is the prevention. This is the prevention, and it is the most important. What we haven't talked about, and I don't quite know how to do, is to change the way our city, all of us, those who are possibly, possibly helpful, to change the brand of this school district. It is a school district that has lots of failures. But if we continue to say failing, failing, broken, broken, we smear all that. I'm telling you, we smear it all over those children. We shame the children. We've got to find some way to talk about the, the ways the district is going to improve and not sugarcoat anything. We're not trying to shine something that's not shiny. But at the same time, we want to hold the children and the excellence of so many thousands of their educators in the light. Sonia Sanchez is asking for haiku. She's gonna do a, they're gonna do a mural and she wants haiku. If you have a haiku that you'd love to do on safety, on peace, it's a very peaceful exercise. We ourselves can be a restorative justice circle here. Here's mine. We need them, these kids, thinking, fighting, growing big, leaving us in time. <laughs>